Hey, what's going on, everybody out there? Happy Saturday. I hope you're having a great day. Now, this is my same room that I shoot my lessons in, but the backdrop I've just lifted. So if you look behind me, there's a bunch of cases and stuff. I store cases and gear behind the backdrop. So there's a little extra room back there of storage. Uh, now this back here is a water heater. Yes, for my house. I'm in my garage. And 14 years ago, when I started making clips, it was in this very room. Um, in fact, when my wife and I looked at this place and we were looking to, to buy a house, I saw this bonus area in the garage and I was like, I want this house. That's going to be my man cave area, my, my guitar area and where I can jam and maybe teach lessons there. That's what I was thinking. So I'm in there, um, but also it's kind of nostalgic because in my earliest videos, when I had no idea what I was doing, I, I still don't fully know what I'm doing, but I have experience now in, in that improvising <laughs> this whole career but back then I had the water heater in a bunch of videos and people would always comment on that and so I'm letting you get a peek at that and also I'm gonna go through the guitars I have in this room so in other words this isn't my entire guitar collection uh, because some are put away in cases and I just really can't get to them but this is kind of like my current grab guitars I can grab. So I'm going to just start right with this one that I was playing. And this was actually given to me by the wonderful, lovely people at Gibson Guitar. Um, we've got one of my favorites. I, this was one of my fantasy guitars when I worked at a guitar store in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The Candyman strings and things. Shout out Candyman in Santa Fe. There was a guitar exactly like this on the wall that I, it was like one of, you know, as an employee, it was one of the guitars I would grab and play all the time and I never got to buy it. So this is a TV yellow Les Paul Special. Now a full on Les Paul has a, another cap of wood that, on top. So it'd be a piece of wood like this, but then also another maple cap on top. Um, whereas this is just one piece of wood. The color is one of my favorite colors. Uh, this is called TV yellow. And it was called TV yellow because in the old black and white television shows, uh, this particular shade of yellow popped, just popped on, in black and white television. So they started making a lot of guitars this color. You can also see like a classic Keith Richards um, Telecaster color, you know, that blonde uh, butterscotch Telecaster, amazing. Um, so this is one that I've had only for a couple years, maybe not even two years yet. And it's got P90 pickups, which I just love the sound of. Um... So, love this guitar. I've been playing it a lot. Uh, I, I, I was on a five, what I call a, a, a fall tour, a five-week trip where I was shooting all kinds of content all over the place, and since I've been back home for about a week, uh, I got sick, but I'm feeling a lot better now, and this is the guitar I've been playing the most since I've been back, and I love it. Also, huge shout-out to Brian, who's here. What's up, Brian? Not much. Hello, fellas. Here, grab this one, my friend. Thanks. All right, the next one... This is a really, I'm going to just put that on mute. This is a really awesome guitar. This is a, called a rock bridge. And it's a very, very high-end boutique acoustic guitar maker named Brian in uh, Virginia. And this is the, a lot of, really amazing artists play rock bridge acoustics but the one that kind of broke it all open was the uh, dave matthews so this is the this is the brand that dave matthews plays rock bridge very pretty can't look at it thanks to the super chat josh norco josh norco with the super chat thank you but so 
Look at that. Look, I mean, is that not just gorgeous? Shiny. It is nice. True story, Brian, that's watching here, was obsessed with the first Dave Matthews album when it came out a long time ago. That is a long time ago. It is. You can... I, I took a I took a break from uh, from the Grateful Dead and Fish for that one album. <laughs> Dude, you gotta learn how to hang guitars. You see a spot? No, lean it uh, with the that way mm -hmm. up against the where that shirt is. Brian's got some work to do, you guys. All right, next. This one is when people ask me my most sentimental guitar. It is this one. This is a Martin M36 from 1978. Look at that. And this was my dad's acoustic. My dad is still around. He still strums a little bit. But this was my dad's acoustic in the house when I was a little kid growing up. And still in tune. Thank you, Tazba Elfie. Who is it? Tazba Elfie. Tazba Elfie for the super chat? Yep. Thank you so much. So this guitar is a thinner body, but then on the back it's a three-piece back. So it's wider, but thinner this way. And I, Martins are usually really deep and bassy, and this one isn't quite as bassy in, in its frequencies. It's a little more mid-range, but you know, it's just it was my dad's guitar and he gave it to me, so that's always makes it cool. Um, perfectly in tune and I haven't touched it since I've been back on my trip so that means you know it's been at least two months and I haven't grabbed this guitar and I grab it and it's in tune. Martins make amazing acoustic guitars. There's no denying that. Uh, and this is just a special one. This is the one. This is the one I grab. Uh, you know, if there's a fire and I have to leave, I, I'm grabbing this one. And and then I would be grabbing this one, which. I've been using the most in, in since I've gotten since I've gotten this guitar. This is the guitar I've used the most. My favorite electric guitar before YouTube existed. My favorite guitar before the internet was really happening was arch tops and hollow bodies, specifically a Gibson ES335, which I've had a few of these. Uh, bummed about the ones that I had to s sell for various reasons. And then uh, you guys can check out the video on YouTube if you haven't yet. I get a lot of comments on the video, but I got to do a tour of the Gibson factory. And you can check it out on the Marty Music channel. But I got to do a tour of the Gibson factory. And I, wa I walked through the process of this actual guitar getting made every step. <laughs> Thank you, Connor Renshaw. Connor Renshaw with the Super Chat? Yep. Thank you, Connor. I appreciate it. Any comment or question? Thanks for all you do. Oh, thanks so much. Um, so this 335, I, I actually, and it's captured on video forever, because it's on video, and I watched this guitar get made, which there is a lot that goes into making a 335 compared to some of the other models of guitars. Like the top, it's arched. It's not flat. Um, two F holes, so it's semi-hollow because there's a solid block through the middle. So basically, this part is basically just the same as a Les Paul. But then when it gets wider with these chambers, it gets a little bit, the tone is a little more 
woody sounding. Thank you, Alexander Lantigua. Alexander Lantigua. Says all about the 145 progressive. 145 progression. What's really cool about the 145 progression as well, a good thing that you can practice. And so anyway, guys, this is my 2018 or 2019 Gibson ES335, specially made for me in the Gibson factory and I got to be there. So 145, I'll take C, that's the one, F is the four, and G is the five. Something really cool you can practice are the arpeggios, playing the notes of those chords by themselves, like that's a C major, F major. G major, F, C. Thank you, Louis Forward. He says happy birthday yesterday. Louis Forward? Yep. Louis Forward. Happy thank birthday you. yesterday, and thank you, Ryan Worden. Thank you, Ryan Worden. Uh, I did have a birthday, and I got so many well wishes that it was ridiculous, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Jared Vargas says, that's cool, but can you play Wonderwall? And you did play Wonderwall. I did a cover of Wonderwall. Uh, it's awesome. Thank you. Did yeah, you like it, Brian? I did. I thought it was really, really amazing. I and don't even like Wonderwall. I know, and I can, I can say it's amazing because the stuff that made me so happy, I didn't really have to do it. In other words, an amazing arrangement. I, well, I came up with the arrangement, but an amazing horn arrangement that I had nothing to do with. Amazing organ, amazing drums, production by Alan Evans of the band Soul Live, which is one of my favorite bands. So I've been able to work with him. Uh, I've also been, uh, you know, had the honor of, of being friends and working with the guitar player of Soul Live, Eric Krasno, for years. We've been friends for close to 30 years. And uh, if you don't know Eric Krasno or Soul Live, go check it out because um, they're awesome. They're just so good. Yeah. Thank, thank you, The Edge Report. Another Edge super report. chat. Yep. Thank you for the he super says, Marty, thanks for your contribution to my musical journey. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure, and I really appreciate those super chats, you guys. I don't really push for them, but, uh, but man, you know, it helps pay for the tacos after this. Okay, so this is a Fender Custom Shop Stratocaster uh, 1962 reissue, Lightly Relics. So this is the kind of relic that I like where it's very... Very modest relicking. It's not super beat up. You can just see a little bit of wear. Um, that wear on the neck there, that's been relicked. The, the white pickguard that's faded into a mint green is what they call it. Beautiful single coil Fender Custom Shop pickups. And uh, I was shooting this, some content over 10 years ago with this guitar collector named Al Romano. And while we were shooting it, and unfortunately that it was a TV pilot that never actually came out, so you guys haven't seen it. I've actually done things you don't know about. Um, but I was shooting this TV pilot uh, with this guitar collector, and he just in the middle of shooting with the cameras on, he said, Marty, do you have a good strat? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> was everyone saying, say no? Yeah, yeah. Say so no. behind the camera, they're like, say no. I was like, no, no, I don't. And he was like, well, check this one out. And he pulled it out of the case. And uh, I, I still remember the case, if I found the right case for it, it smells of very strong incense, which I don't know why that is, but it just is. So the guitar kind of has a hippie incense smell essence. Um, but anyway, Al handed me the guitar and uh, said, I want you to have it and play it. So 
I've always cherished that because that was so generous. And I feel like there's mojo in those moments. So like when someone, like for instance, um, I think Jimmy Page's main Les Paul was given to him uh, by, uh, by, you know, the James Gang uh, Eagles guitar player. Who is that, Brian, again? Uh, Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh. So, I, so and, and look what happened there. So when, when someone is kind enough to, like, give you a gift like that, just has that, like, vibe. So I want to use it. So I love this guitar. It's great. Um, Thank you again, Josh Norco. Thanks, Josh. Another one. He matched this one to the color of the guitar he wants to see. And thank you, Louis Forward, again. All right, Brian, you're going to have to Louis says, here. thanks for the Sultans of Swing duet. Or, oh, yeah. I know, I know who that is. How awesome. Uh, all right. For dropping things. What do I, what, how can I help? Um, just hold that one, and you're going to hand it to me Ooh, soon. Ooh, the Tiger King. I was watching a thing about him. Yeah, so we <laughs> Tiger King. So this here is a Kramer, which is a, a subsidiary, or, it, you know, it's... It's Gibson. Pacer series. It wasn't cheap, and I bought it. This one they didn't give to me. I, I bought it, and it was just, uh, yeah, maybe I was watching a little too much Tiger King, Brian. You didn't. You don't have anything like that in your collection. No, and you know sometimes I do those goofy uh, ads and different things where I'm, you know, like hundred things guitar players say and stuff like that. I just needed a shred stick. And so this was the one and I've done like a Van Halen lesson on it. And, and I know that's not my strength is the metal or the, or the super heavy rock, but it's fun to have. It's got the whammy bar. It's got the tiger stripes. <laughs> it's got the humbuckers. It's got the Floyd Rose uh, bridge system for deep dive bombs, Brett Papa style. And by the way, Brian and I both grew up with Brett Papa, so Brian knows all about Brett Papa playing Ozzy Osbourne and stuff when we were like 12 oh, yeah. years old, 13 years old. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, here, take this one, Brian, thank you. Hand me that one. So these are really amazing and affordable guitars. These are Epiphones, and these are, let's see what, this is the... So this is the ES-339, which I feel is a little smaller than the 335. Yeah. So we've got the Sunburst is a 335, and this awesome blue, silverish blue color is the 339. Now, when I used to, when I was in college and when I worked at the Candyman in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Epiphones that they had back then they were pretty good, but the, uh, they just didn't really stay in tune very, very well. And so what I've been so stoked to see is the, the care that the new people at Gibson have put into revitalizing the Epiphones. Um, they stay in tune. They sound fantastic. And they're totally affordable compared to, you know, a normal ES-335. Um, what do you think, Brian? They look, they look nice. These are the ones that are up in the on the wall in yeah, my uh, yeah. in my bonus room upstairs. Yeah. No, I love that that silver blue color. Yeah, I do too. So yeah. I took these down from there just to to show them to you to, you know, and here's the thing: I unfortunately only have two hands, so that means that I can only play. Personally, I'm not Michelangelo Batio, <laughs> so personally, I can only play one guitar at a time. So when you got a lot of them, but he's playing one guitar, just happens to have. <laughs> It's two guitars, Brian. <laughs> it's actually four guitars. Melded together. Yeah, it's four guitars melded together. Get it right. I know you're not a full-time musician, but... So that's a 335 and a 339? 335, 339. Cool. And you can see that the 339 is smaller, right? Yeah. And they're both... Is it lighter, too, or is it similar? It's similar. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take these away. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away now. Take it away. Take it away. And this one's been asked for. This is the one that's been asked for by multiple people. What, that one? No, the one you're holding. Oh. Josh Norco. All right. Next, folks. And what's funny is some people think I, I've gotten a new Stratocaster. Uh, 
or you can um, put that one right there. Thanks. So this is a Fender custom shop 1960 reissue. So my red one, ooh, it's nice and in tune. So my red Strat is a custom shop that someone gave to me. And this one, this is actually probably the 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 most buy, uh, the most the most I've spent on a guitar. So the three thirty five and Les Paul I have cost more, but I fortunately got those two working with Gibson, so I didn't buy them. But this one I bought with no connection to anyone. I just bought it from a dealer, and I just have always dreamed of having a Seafoam green Strat. And if you guys have noticed, actually, my guitar teacher from college, Chris Sherlin, who's on the channel sometimes, I mentioned him earlier. If you see on his channel, he actually has a Seafoam Strat and he used to give me lessons with that guitar. And so that's like part of uh, just remembering those old times. I think why I fell in love with that color so much because I took these great guitar lessons back then in my late teens, early twenties. And my mentor had this color. Now, some of my YouTube videos where I've used this in the last year or so, it, it actually looks uh, uh, light blue, and I don't have a light blue Strat. Green is a is a weird uh, color to correct on video, and so if you guys have noticed my gray backdrop for the last year, um, my light blue grayish backdrop, it, that's actually a green screen that's recolored. So when that gets recolored and I have a guitar that has shades of green in it, that green gets sucked out because of the coloring on the backdrop. So it ends up looking like more of a baby blue. But this is the, uh, this is the guitar. Now this is Relic. It's, it's a little heavier Relic than I probably would have, would have chosen. But what you get is also the way a guitar feels and sounds. And I don't have any beat up looking guitars. So because I have, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a bunch of guitars, you know, if I only had one, I probably wouldn't have it Relic on choice, but to be able to have one. And, and another cool thing about the Relic though, I mean, it does look cool. Some people don't like it, but they've worn down the back of the neck. So it's like nice and smooth behind your thumb, which I really dig. Um, so that's just something that, you know, that I like about it. So let's, let's just, we got to trim this Real quick. Thank you, Tom Cho, and thank you, Laura Sosa. Laura Sosa and Tom Cho. Tom Cho. For the Super Chats. Yep. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, are people uh, commenting, enjoying the video so far? Oh, definitely. Somebody wants to know when you're selling the loopers again. Well, the loopers are a problem because they sold out, and then now with... Uh, it's the buzzword of the week, uh, supply chain issues. <laughs> Some say they've, they've never existed until now. Um, <laughs> but um, it's just, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to, to make that happen right now. But I am, among a thousand other things, I am still pursuing the next looper. It just hasn't happened. But you could help me get a looper faster if you were to buy... Uh, my overdrive and my delay pedal. That would help. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see here. What do I got? Oh, got to do. Custom Shop Strat. See, Thank you, Z. Z. Z said, can you play some Jimi Hendrix? Uh, 
I can. And then you kind of did. Um, and then Scott Sykes. Oh, actually, that wasn't Jimi Hendrix, Brian. You no. know who that was? No. That was Jambi Hendrix. Jambi. <laughs> and then Scott Sipes wants to know, do you still have your Heritage Prospect? I still have my Heritage Prospect, and that one, uh, I have my Heritage 535 right here, which I haven't grabbed yet. The Heritage Prospect, I do still have. Um, I had used it for a recording session, and so it was in the case. It's in the case out in my garage. Uh, that one's not, I can't get to that one today. <laughs> but I have it. It's buried. Uh, it's buried. Buried alive! Thank you, The Edge Report, another one. Who? He likes the Gimme Shelter lesson. Who said he that? He's uh, the Edge Report. The Edge Report. Thank you. He said he built a ES-335 <laughs> kit to play it. We built the city? What? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is my Les Paul, given to me by Gibson, probably a year and a half, two years ago. I would guess it's like a 2018 or 2019 uh, I was doing some content making in Nashville, and I was doing some some Gibson videos for for Gibson, and so they loaned me this Les Paul to use for the sessions I was doing. I think it was a couple Led Zeppelin lessons or something, and uh, that case. Uh, right there, I'm almost touching it. The brown case, the last case there. It's got this. It's got the serial number on it. it says Les Paul. So that this was like one of Gibson's. I guess probably like one of their loner guitars when people were in Nashville and some artists needed a Les Paul to use. I think some other people have used this. It was like one of those. And then when the pandemic hit and they Gibson asked me to do a series of live streams for them, which Brian, you were there for. That's a blur, huh? Definitely. It's kind of a blur. It was a weird time. But they sent this to me. They're like, we're going to send you a Les Paul to use. And they sent it to me, and I didn't look at the case carefully or anything. I pulled this guitar out. I pulled this guitar out. I swear I had like the the physical feeling of of having played this guitar before. I'm like I swear this is the guitar from that session. And so then I looked at the case and then I went through my phone stories because I'd had, you know, I'm always taking social media pictures and so I like went through my phone pictures and went way 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 down. And I found a picture of it from that earlier session. And the serial number happened to be in the picture on the case. And so I matched them, and it was the same guitar. So I was like, yes! So now it's mine. Thank you to the real John Kearns. The real John Kearns. He said, any advice for a 50-year-old who just started guitar? Any advice for a 50-year-old just starting guitar? Don't get bogged down with information overload. <laughs> overload. And overlord. What you want to do, my friend, it doesn't matter what age you are, but what you really, really need to do, and I say it over and over, uh, if you haven't, you know, on uh, Patreon is a page I have. And there's a couple guys who have the highest tier on Patreon and get a video lesson with me once a month. Um, you can find me on Patreon if you want to look that up. But one of my friends, John, who I teach, I tell him to slow the things down that he's working on. And I've noticed through my whole life of teaching guitar, even before YouTube, it's the hardest thing to get a student to do 
is literally you want to go through the mechanics in like slow motion, then speed it up, not play it all sloppy fast. You can practice it that way, but to get to the quickest point of playing guitar efficiently, having fun playing songs, sitting in with buddies, all that stuff, you got to like take a song and play it in super slow motion. You know, if I teach you a blues lick, what did I do here? Thank you, Josh Norco. Uh, Thank Josh. you, Ron Timmons. Thank you, Nicholas C. Nicholas C., Ron Timmons. We all know Josh Norco. Brian's jealous I've met Josh Norco now. I know. That's what his comment was. I wish Brian could have come to the Sweetwater. Uh, that would have been fun. I uh, wish Brian could have come to the Sweetwater. Uh, you know, maybe next time. They, they, they want me to come back. But Josh Norco, who you guys is, is such a great supporter, um, I flew him out to Sweetwater. You're going to see a video later on that. I surprised him um, with some amazing things, I think, and we had a great time. We drank some beer, broke bread, and hung out at Sweetwater. And while I was at Sweetwater, it just so happens that Joe Bonamassa was playing in town that night, and I literally went to the Joe Bonamassa show, and he personally asked to meet me. That's awesome. And I went and hung out with Joe Bonamassa for about an hour after his concert, and that was... Uh, Absolutely amazing. And he was so cool to me. Yeah, what's up, Brian? Thank you, Michael Green. Michael Green. Thanks, man. Okay, so this is the Les Paul that I used uh, before I got that one. This one, I think, is from probably 2014 or 2013, maybe. And it's it's before the new it, it, Gibson people took it over. Uh, I definitely don't think this one is as nice as the special 50 so this is a les paul standard though i love the burst i think it looks great but it just doesn't play as great as my 50 special uh it doesn't feel as great it just doesn't feel as solidly put together but i mean don't get me wrong I, I still love it but but this one's been a wall fixture because i got a nicer les paul and this one looks really cool up on the wall in my bonus room um this is, has the tapered neck, so the neck feels smaller, um, especially compared to the other Les Paul. And then it's got like stuff that I don't like on a Les Paul, like it's not in tune, but the push pull, so you can uh, make them single coil, which I don't really think a Les Paul should be single coil. I, I just it's like take a strap for single coil play a Les Paul or Humbucker. One thing that I do like about this one, though, is it's got the locking tuners. So that that's just makes restringing it a lot easier, um, a lot more convenient. Thank you, all. Alex Otwell. Alex Otwell. He thanks. says, uh, he can't believe you don't own a PRS. We've got a few people who mentioned the PRS. Funny enough, I do own a PRS, uh, but it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a seven string. And it's in Nashville uh, at the studio I work with there because I did uh, some heavier lessons with it. So technically I do own a PRS, but it is not here. The other thing about PRS, I think they make amazing guitars, and I played a bunch of them in a Sweetwater video coming. Um, I have nothing against PRS. Um, I hear John Mayer plays one. That was a joke. He does play one, and I know that. Um, so this is my old SG. Never really, I bought it used at a music store. It never really felt that solid to me. Totally out of tune, but this is another one that's up in my bonus room. Uh, if you look at any of my old videos from at least like five years ago, anytime I was playing SG, it was this one. It used to have a funky, marbly um, pick guard on it that was very divisive uh, back then. Half the audience hated it half the audience loved it i always thought that was interesting um so i switched out the pick guard myself but then eventually i would meet the fine people at gibson such as jc caesar heather and mark agnesi and they were kind enough to send me a bomb bomb ass SG. This thing is just as good as an SG gets. So I don't know what you actually SG standard maybe? 
I'm sure someone else out there knows. Uh -huh. But just this perfect cherry SG, folks. And, uh... <laughs> out the akadaka akadaka uh i i don't know if i should give away my plan in this video but my plan in this video since i'm showing off my guitars and those videos tend to get views for a, for a long time uh the engagement on them i've consciously today only and i don't always do this as you know but consciously today i'm not playing any famous riffs you notice that brian yeah. I haven't I haven't done that. No, you haven't. Yeah, because then, you know, I'd sit in here, spend an hour talking about all my different guitars, and that five seconds I play of Back in Black, now ACDC gets all the money for the whole video. Um, and I'm not focused on the money of it, but I'm just deciding for this video is just mine. I'm not sharing this video with Led Zeppelin or ACDC or Jimi Hendrix. Just this once, okay? That's all I'm saying. Um, now this guitar, other than so far, other than the Martin acoustic I played, this is the guitar I've had the longest. Uh, my dad, once again, my dad's really cool, you guys. He does not want to ever be on camera, but he's very cool. Um, he bought this guitar for me uh, as uh, my college graduation gift. And so I was, at the time, I was playing in this uh, 70s funk corporate cover band called The Function in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, this became my main guitar for that. And I was in that band, a very solid working band for about four years or so, three or four years, where that was my main gig. That's what I, my main gig for a living was playing in this band with guys that are now my age now. So I was like a young 20 something playing with older 40 year old guys uh, I learned a lot. I had a great time. I'm still in touch with them. And then once again, I'll bring up my guitar teacher, Chris Sherland, again, uh, because he was the guitar player in that band. And he decided to leave Santa Fe, New Mexico to follow a woman. You know, I know, big shock. Uh, but no, he went with, uh, I think, who is his wife now of 20 years. Uh, he moved with, with her, I think, to uh, Colorado. And so he left the band, and he set me up beautifully with an audition. You know, I didn't, I didn't, the gig was not given to me, but Chris put in a good word and helped me prepare for an audition to play a bunch of these, like, 70s funk songs. And I got the gig, and I became, quote-unquote, a professional guitar player um, right out of college. Well, actually, I was still in college. My senior year of college, I was playing in that band, so I was able to like actually support myself before I graduated college playing guitar. That's a it's a double edged sword though, because there's no career path. You just kind of all of a sudden are making a little money with it, and then you, it, it kind of ruins the day job for the rest of your life because you don't want to get one. <laughs> um, but so this is this American uh, American standard Telecaster blonde white pick guard and I want to say this is a uh, I'm pretty sure this is from 1995 that would be my guess 
Uh, but once again, I'm not playing the famous stuff, but something that you would hear on this guitar back then. still watching yes okay so really affordable guitar they've gone up a little bit since i first discovered them is the tajima it's a brazilian brand similar to a brazilian percussion instrument known as the tambourine that was just an inside joke very inside <laughs> joke but uh uh brazilian company that makes you know equivalent to like a fender squire um super solid guitars for the price i mean I want to say I got this guitar for like 150 bucks, and you know you've got the offset. It's fun for the for the grungy stuff. Let's see if I have a any patches here. <laughs> Thank you, the Edge Report. Who is that? Edge Report, and it's his third Super Chat today. Man, all the Super Chats are so nice. Definitely, it's a big Super Chat day. Yeah, it's gonna, we're going to pay for tacos. Oh, you're a lot of tacos. By the way, the tacos should be here, I think. So, anyway, uh, here's a guitar that might be in the most videos I've ever made. It's certainly the most hours I think I've put on any one individual guitar, because I gigged before I was making videos and stuff, I used this guitar for ton, you know, thousands of gigs. And I can see here all the wear on it. I mean, you would think it's relics, but it's, it's legitimate, legitimate wear. So this is a Heritage 535. It's probably from the 90s, I would say. And Heritage is in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, the Heritage Factory was originally the Gibson Guitar Factory, and then Gibson moved to Tennessee, and a lot of the fine folks in Michigan at the Heritage Factory decided to stay and buy the factory and start their own guitar company uh, known as Heritage. So you can see the body is the exact same as an ES-335. Apparently one of the things about pat patent patents on guitars are the silhouette of the headstock. So you see lots of Fender style guitars where their headstock is as close as they can legally get to looking like a Fender headstock, but then it's just a little different. So if you see here on this Heritage guitar, it's the same thing. It's uh, not, it's not the same. It's cut out there. Uh, but what I will say is they're great guitars. I have, I've used this guitar more than any other guitar. They're based on Gibsons. And I am super happy with the new Gibson from the last three years. Or I don't know how long it's been now where Gibson went bankrupt and then got taken over. Since they've taken over, they've focused on just 
quality guitars. You know, before they were there, they had they were selling speakers and they had robot tuners and all this crazy bloated things that they were doing. And when the new people took over, they just went bare bones. We're going to do Les Pauls, SGs, 335s, etc. You know, and make them the highest quality possible and take it from there. And so they really did. So I absolutely love the new Gibsons. Um, but I will say this, because I've used this heritage, like I said, since before YouTube existed. And I've had three or four instances of meeting people at Heritage Guitars and um, giving them full first opportunity to work with me uh, on a more business setting. Um, there's been probably three times in, in 14 years where I've had conversations with them. And uh, things as simple as, because I like the guitar, they promised to send me like their Les Paul version and then never did. Um, or uh, there was three different times where like, okay, we, we got one on the way to you and then it didn't come. And then also a time where later, because well, maybe they have some new people there, but later, we're talking, you know, millions of views later, they, I said, let's work together in the business setting, and their best offer was to loan me a guitar for, uh, for a, a few weeks or something to use in videos. So it was just kind of, like, in, insane. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't like the guitars. It just means that... Uh, I was never gonna work, you know. I was never gonna work with them on a higher level. It just wasn't. It was them. They just weren't. Didn't show me that they would. So I still have this one and the Prospect, and they're great. But uh, you know, Gibson Gibson's really treating me well. All right. Thank you, Colton Daly. Colton Daly. And thank you, Penn State Yellow Jacket. Penn State Yellow Jacket. Yay! Go Yellow Jackets. All right. So here's two acoustics, and then we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, this is the main acoustic I've been using forever, or not forever, but since I've had it. It's a tried and true guitar. It's the Gibson J45 with a nice burp. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> this is the J45. I'm only looking at the backs of acoustics. This is the J45 with a beautiful burst on it. And then they're not actually making this one anymore. This is the G45. I just happened to score it, though. And it's a great guitar. G45. Um, I guess they probably replaced this G45 with, they have a new acoustic that's got a sound hole on the top here that they're using. Um, so there are a bunch of, there, there's a handful of other guitars I have put away, um, but this is another one of the guitars since I've had it that I've used the most. talk too much trash about heritage there Brian no I was telling the truth that's all sometimes I don't even tell the truth I mean sometimes I just avoid it all the story altogether but that was one where like people were like oh you're playing Gibson now what happened to your heritage and it was like you know I still love it I have nothing against it but it's just things happen and look look at all the Gibsons I just showed you <laughs> and I got those for free um and they're awesome. Gibson's, Gibson, I've, and, oh, and uh, one more thing about the PRS. The first nice guitar I ever bought that I saved money with was for a PRS. Um, uh, way early, so that was the 90s. I had a really nice McCarty model, um, Tobacco Sunburst. It was a great guitar. Uh, it didn't work. It didn't really cut through for that funky music I was playing at the time, like a Telecaster. 
doesn't like I mean a PRS can do a lot. It's a, like it's like a Ferrari, and a Telecaster is like a you know like a muscle car. Uh, but I eventually got rid of the PRS to get my first ES three thirty five, and I don't regret that at all. Um, but I do think PRS they make dude PRS make amazing guitars. So not saying they don't, but I over time I've really just stuck as a traditionalist and to me you know when I see the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Led Zeppelin you know it's Fenders and Gibsons Strats, Tellys, Les Pauls, SG's, 335's that's just my thing I'm into that traditional vibe so that's where I'm at with it um, but it doesn't mean I don't like them. Brian any final thoughts or anything yeah people notice some brands that are missing yeah yeah taylor wasn't here. oh yes okay so taylor um i like taylor guitars and i play them a lot so i'm not excluding them specifically but yes thank you for reminding me that that was one of the things i wanted to say um they're awesome taylor makes great guitars but those I think I have about four or five really beautiful tailors, and they play great, and I, I do use them, but they are all in cases right now um, in my garage put away. I just didn't, because I've been using this Gibson and that Rockbridge for the last couple years, you know, I'm trying to protect my other guitars, and so those are just protected away in cases. So, yes, I'm sorry I, I didn't include those, because I don't have any tailors made... They're, Taylor's are like the best, like chill on the couch acoustic guitar. They're really easy to play. They sound great. They're an awesome company. The people there are great. Um, so, all good, all good with them. I just they're they're all put away. So, maybe you never know. In the near future, I would uh, you know I could always uh, go through some of those. I didn't get to everyone to every guitar today. What else what was I? So you don't have any Gretsch. I don't have any Gretsch, uh, and I. Gretsch is owned by Fender, I think. So that's probably, I mean, I've never gotten any free. And I don't work with Fender uh, uh, in any capacity. Um, but, I mean, sh who doesn't want a country gentleman? You yeah. Know? I, I would love to have one. I, it's, it's funny, I didn't even think about them until <laughs> someone said it. It's like, oh, that's right. Because as you know, I have a lot of guitars here. Uh, a couple I didn't get to, I have like four or five Dan Electros that they just sent to me, like unsolicited, like not even talking to them. It just came in the mail. Um, so I've got a cool electric 12 string. Um, my Taylor acoustic 12 string I love. So if you're interested in a, looking for a 12 string acoustic Taylor, really kicks butt on those. So yeah, no Gretsch. No Rickenbacker. No Rickenbacker. Uh, Beatles, Tom Petty, amazing, classic. Never owned one. Uh, it'd be awesome to have a Rickenbacker 12 string electric. That would be really, really cool. So. Rickenbacker, I'm listening. Yep. <laughs> Should I shout out my P.O. box uh, out loud? <laughs> yeah, uh, Gretsch, Rickenbacker. Gretsch. What's a Supro? Someone keeps saying Supro. Supro. Uh, they, uh, Supro, I think that's the amp. Well, I mean, it's, I guess guitars too, but Supro, I think that's the amp Eric Krasno is using. And I played through it. It's awesome. So it's, it's awesome. not a guitar. They don't make guitars. They, make. No, they might do soup, but they definitely make amps. What else? Right, Ibanez. Ibanez, yeah. Jackson. Jackson. That's that heavy. That's more the heavy metal. I feel Your like Kramer. a lot of those boutique heavy metals have been acquired by like some other big companies. Um, Schechter is another brand, but I mean, ba as far as brands that I'm working with, I work with Gibson. Gibson doesn't prohibit anything, any other guitars. I absolutely have full full freedom to play any guitar I want with, even though I work with Gibson. Um, but when it, someone treats you really well like they have, I'm just motivated to play their guitars more because it's just uh, it feels right when you're treated right, you know. When people don't treat you right, I'm not as excited to feature their products for, for free. It's pretty simple. Any, anything else, Brian? Oh, a lot of people noticed that guitar in the corner of your shot. <laughs> and, um... That was for the finale. <laughs> that was for the finale. They, they caught me. 
This What's your best opinion. business advice on getting a gig? Thank you, Tanner Sandell. Best business advice on getting a gig? Well, I'm definitely out of the game when it comes to that. Um, but man, I don't know what age you are or whatever, but like, you got to bring people. You got to bring people. I mean, however you do that, you're networking, hanging out, becoming friends with other bands, hanging out at the places that you want to play at and getting to know people. Um, it is all networking. Um, I mean, being a good band helps. But when, but you, when you do get the chance, but if you're the best band make in sure the, the world, people come. When you're the best band in the world and you show up and no one shows up, that's all the that's all they care about. Um, most people that are like booking venues and owning venues, I mean, some of them are passionate about music and the bands that come through, but they want people to come and buy drinks. Ultimately, that's, they have uh, that's what they're there for. They have earplugs in, and it's like, who's this band? Like. No, what are the numbers? They, they want people to buy drinks. How are bar do tonight? You know what I mean? So if you play a show and you could just be really crappy, but you're able to bring people and they're able to bring people and you guys rage and have a great time and everyone's happy, they'll ask you back. But if you show up um, and go, what the hell? You didn't, pr-, you know, as a band, it's funny when a band like yells at the promoter. You didn't bring anyone. Like, you didn't promote the show enough. And the venue owner is saying, you didn't bring anyone. You didn't promote enough. Right? They both, you both need it. You both need it to be successful. So it's real simple. Bring people. Have them spend money. It's as simple as that. But to lead up to that first opportunity, yeah, you got to network, go to the places that you want to play at, meet the bands that are similar to you. So you could like share a night. That's another thing. You got to find another, you know, the ult- ultimately it's great to find a band that's doing better than you, that's similar, that you befriend and, and open for them and start to, you know, grab other bands' audiences to, to like you as well. I mean, these are all kind of like logical things, but it's true. It's when it comes to gigging, what is a gig? Like it's a business for the place you're playing at and if no one shows up, they don't get excited about it. Um, actually, funny story about that. So there was a place I played at all the time in Costa Mesa, California, called Le Cave. It's still there. And I had a regular Saturday gig there uh, before this YouTube thing took off for me. And eventually, around 2008, it just kind of ran its course and we got laid off. And then the YouTube thing happened for me. And I decided I had a gig in New York that I booked. So I thought it'd be fun to book another gig to warm up for the New York gig. And so I reached out to the people at Lakov and they were like, yeah, sure, we'll give it a shot. But then I made a YouTube video and said, I'm giving away. I had some, I think it was an SG. Can't even remember now. I think it was an SG that I had bought. I don't know. I bought a guitar. And I made a YouTube video and said, hey, I'm playing this gig in Costa Mesa, and I'm going to do a raffle, and I'm going to give away this guitar. Not this one, but I did a guitar giveaway. Um, And I had bought raffle tickets. So anyone that came to the gig, and the gig was free. There was no cover charge or anything like that. The gig was totally free. I promoted it on YouTube, saying, I'm giving away a guitar to someone. Um, So people showed up, and and I had someone at the front and one raffle ticket to each person that came in, and it was packed. Um, You know, people wanted a free, really nice guitar, uh, but uh, but it was absolutely packed. The night went amazing. Uh, About two thirds of them left after I did the giveaway, which is fine, because I, we did a whole first set, and I said, don't worry, we're doing, we're not waiting till the end of the night to do the giveaway, but I'm not, I'm certainly not doing it before the first set's done. (laughs) So we played the first set, we took a break, and then opened the second set with the giveaway. So it wasn't that late. I didn't push it to the, you know, push it past the limits of people's patience and stuff. And then finally did the giveaway and a bunch of people left. But by that point, it was a very successful night. And so keep in mind, this was a place that laid off the band I was in because it was just the numbers thing. And people were sick of us because we played every Saturday, whatever it was, things change. But ever since I did that gig, the, that owner, the, the book, or the guy that booked it, 
he called us. I mean, he started calling, asking me to play again, like constantly. When he, uh, when you want to do another gig, and it wasn't because like he had some epiphany about how great the show was. He looked at the end of the night's receipts and was like, "Holy crap! How much more? How often can we do this?" And so he started calling me to get booked the book gig, and I, you know, I was just too busy. I mean, it, it's it wasn't like a. It takes a lot of energy and time and practice to put a show together, and I have a much better forum, if you will, for reaching people now. Uh, so I just wasn't interested. But, but I mean, that's kind of the how it works. All right. So this I bought when my daughter was born. I have a teen. My daughter's a teenager now. But when she was born, I saw this for sale on Craigslist for like 50 bucks. And I was fantasizing about my daughter playing guitar someday. And she doesn't really play, and that's fine. But this was bought for her. And so I've just held on to it. It's pretty funky. It's a, it's a debutante. Is that what it says? Dele, dele, ta, dele, dele tante? Anyway, Daisy Rock. That's the name of the game. <laughs> That's it, folks. Uh, maybe I'll do a follow-up because I do have other guitars, but I haven't done that in a long time, and I got been getting a million requests all the time to do this. Um, honestly, I'm, I don't get that excited about like trying to brag or show off things like that, so I put it off. But I know people want to see it, so I'm doing it for the people that kept re requesting, not to show you my awesome, not to show off, but to fulfill the requests that I was constantly getting to give an update on my guitars. Maybe so, next year you'll have a Gretsch and a Rickenbacker. And... I just, well, I'm so busy <coughs> making videos all the time. If you haven't noticed, a video comes out every day, and I'm not deep faking it, so I'm really doing that. Oh, that'd be Tom Cruise. That'd be Tom Cruise <laughs> deep fake, but I'm not deep faking it. It's really me, and so I'm pretty damn busy, and I haven't even remembered that those other brands you mentioned exist, because... I'm not even looking for guitars currently. I'm just looking to make more videos. So, uh, yeah, so you guys inspire me. Maybe you will see a Rickenbacker 12-string electric or a, a Gretsch Country Gentleman. Uh, I'm not looking for one, but but they're awesome, and it, it could happen. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for all those super chats and support. Um, got more videos coming your way, and, you know, like I've said this over and over, I'm going to keep doing this as long as you'll have me. Um, so even though this video is ending now, you can let me know in the comments, you know, requests you'd like to see, all that. I do look at that. So let me know. Thank you again to Brian. Thank you for watching, everyone. All the Super Chats are great. And thank you to my friends and family. We'll see you again next time.